Good afternoon, Mr. Guarnaccia. Good afternoon, Allison. How are you? I'm well. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Uh, I really appreciate it. I'm happy to be here. So um, let's begin, because this is such a magnificent book, and I have a feeling I could talk for hours with you about it. But <laughs> um, where does the story behind this book begin? Well, the story really begins with the uh, realization at a certain point that every pasta name, besides the fact that there's so much fun to say, <laughs> um, have these great backstories that every pasta name, I mean, in English, to me growing up, even though I grew up in a, a partly Italian-American household, they were nonsense words. They were <clears throat> these wonderful uh, extravagantly long collections of syllables, but they were f just fun to say. And then I began to realize, I, I realized because I, I do speak Italian, I, I went to Italy and learned the language. Oh yeah, spago is string, spaghetti is little strings. And pasta name by pasta name, I realized that every single name has some great meaning, funny meaning, colorful. They're so inventive. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I just, I, I couldn't not start drawing pictures that illustrated the wondrous <laughs> nature of these names. <laughs> and so it really began with words. It began with the names. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you say that it began with words because considering that we know you as an illustrator and designer for, for mainly writing children's books as well, and there's nothing childish about, about all that, even though you're saying that it's, it just brings out the child at heart when we say farfalle and spaghetti and... <laughs> <laughs> you say and you say them wonderfully. <laughs> well, and it's true. And um, you know, having I, I've got a couple of kids, one thirty-five and one eight. But um, the eight-year-old is totally in love with words. She's, you know, turning them around in her mouth, and she herself is bilingual. Actually, my wife is German, so she speaks German and English. Wow. And the the consciousness that words are more than just their meaning, but that they're their sound is to me, uh, can be very sophisticated, but it's also really playful. And kids, as they acquire language, obviously, um, I think they, they um, one of their first sort of gateways into words is just the way they sound on the mouth and then the meanings and on and on from there. So if the story begins with words, then how do the illustrations come about? Well, um, I love visual metaphor. I always, and I, I, I think it's, it's partly the way um, my mind is tuned. Um, I'm always seeing something and seeing what else it could be. Uh, you know, a tape dispenser could be a, a, a snail. Um, and this is this has always been my strategy in making editorial illustrations for uh, magazines, for newspapers, and it's played a big part in the books I illustrate. And so, um, when you have a, a a set of words, the names of pasta, that are in and of themselves uh, metaphors and visual metaphors, mm -hmm. it seemed. Uh, it, it seemed like a perfect trove of material to turn into pictures. Mm -hmm. You know, really, every every one of these, Farfalle isn't just a butterfly, but it's <sighs> a pasta butterfly. But, but Stephen, that's uh, my Orecchete. favorite. Yeah, that's my favorite one. It's funny you mentioned Farfalle, because do you mind if I, I'm just going to read yeah, a, quick, absolutely. a quick example, because here's how it begins. There's a beautiful illustration on the left-hand side, and then Farfalle catchers get an early start, sometimes waking before dawn. That's when the juiciest and most succulent Farfalle pasta can be found clinging to the stems of flowers and drinking their dew. I mean, that 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 is so, that's <laughs> a story within a story. It's so amazing. I love that visual metaphor. Well, thank you. Thank you. I also like kind of the crossing genre so that at the same time that you're recognizing a, a farfalla pasta um, as something that you eat and could be succulent and could be juicy, especially in a rich tomato sauce, it also, you're playing with the idea that really, am I going to eat a 
butterfly that flies from <laughs> flower to flower. But the butterfly itself, of course, is is uh, sipping dew. And so, I, you know, I, I like kind of getting inside the life of each of these, mm -hmm. each of these shapes and its meanings. And mm -hmm. especially because so many of them are uh, animal based, you know, the snails, the lumake, or uh, human body part based. Um, and uh, well, give me an example yeah. of that. Well, uh, I happen to be looking at tortellini. And tortellini, <laughs> though tortellini means little cakes, the legend has it that they were designed based on Venus's belly button. That <laughs> a, a um, an innkeeper, uh, unbeknownst to him, was hosting Venus in disguise, and he looked through the keyhole and he saw Venus's belly button, and it inspired him to create pasta in the shape of a belly button, if you can believe it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's quite fascinating because when we think of, of children's books and, and recipes, uh, recipe books for children, um, this, the one that you've created along with uh, Chef Thomas, is not something that I expected. I'll be quite honest. I was pleasantly surprised with the beauty of it. And considering the recipes that are for children, I mean, this to me is not a definition of when you walk in a restaurant and you look at a children's menu. That is not it at all. It's so stunning. The the, the ingredients in there, um, the the beauty of not only the artwork and the recipes, it's, it's quite fascinating. Um, had you ever seen any other children's book, children's recipe book like this before? I mean, I don't know them all, but I don't see this as being a very usual way of writing children's books. Well, first of all, we're dealing with Fiden. Fiden has really singled themselves out in the cookbook market. Um, I think of it as cookbook as art book. I mean, their 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 cookbooks uh, are as much for the the real cook as for the cook aspirant. You know, you you want to go through these pages. It's almost um, cookbook porn. You know, you're you're kind of <laughs> yes. it's this. Um, <laughs> you look at these longingly, and even if you don't make a recipe, just reading the ingredients. Heather's uh, instructions are absolutely doable, but they don't play down to exactly. their audience at all. And neither do you, Stephen. When well, and right neither does neither does the. Um, I have to mention Megan ben Bennett, who is the designer of this and, and lots of kids' books for for Fiden. Um, it is a wonderfully sophisticated book that hopefully is sophisticated. I, I, I want the kids to feel like they're stretching when they uh, look at the pictures and get the joke, when they um, <laughs> read the stories and it takes them way beyond anything they thought they wanted to know. Yeah. And when they get into the recipes and they thought, really, can I do this? Of course you can. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it, it kind of raises the bar and brings them up to the bar at the same time. So hmm. um, it was it was a really, really, really satisfying project to work So on. who would you say this book is for? For children in general or maybe even adults for, let's say, children at heart? And I'm, I'm an adult. I'm a 40-year-old adult. <laughs> I, I got a hoot out of reading it. <laughs> yeah, well, in the same way that young adult books are being uh, avidly read by full adults, you know, old adults, um, I do think the line between a kid's book and um, uh, a, a book for a wide audience is, is very blurred. And um, I know that I had my first kid when I was in my 30s. My mom had me when I, she was 20. So I do think that even back in the 80s, there was a real change in what a kid's book could be because the the audience was were educated or they were further along in their careers or they uh, and they were looking for books that were uh, a little more involved, a little more unusual. Visually, uh, production really changed. I mean, that's just sort of history. But I, I think also if you love to cook and you've got kids around you who you want to introduce to cooking, um, this is perfect for that. Mm -hmm. um, my wife cooks and my daughter is always there cooking with her and learning these techniques. And this book is ideal for her because she likes to read. So while 
some part of the recipe is simmering, she can be reading the bizarre or funny backstory of, you know, how this pasta got its name. <laughs> like, for instance, and I have to mention, because it's really my favorite in the yeah. book, is um, what we call cavatappi, which is means uh, uh, cork removers or corkscrews. Oh. Corkscrew pastas, I thought, had been around forever. And then I found out that they only go back to the 60s because the pasta company Barilla uh, in trying to make, this is the legend, anyway, this is the myth, in trying to make a certain kind of pasta, the pasta came out uh, twisted. And they thought, you know, there is a pop star, his name's Adriano Celentano, who is known as Il Mole Giatto, he, the springy one, because he, he, was, he would dance, and if you go, you have to go online after this and look up on YouTube some of... Uh, his videos. He was he was a genuine uh, sensation in Italy, and he bounced around when he danced. Barilla called this pasta Celentani because his name was Celentano, and because they owned the copyright to the name, though they had to spell it with two L's instead of one because Adirano Celentano himself owned the copyright to his own name. But because Barilla owned the copyright to the name, every other company, because you really can't copyright these shapes. You know, once they're out in the world, they're folk art. Um, they get, and in fact, they're usually not invented by a pasta company, but they usually are handed down generation to generation, uh, from person to person. Um, so immediately, these corkscrews got out into the general world of commercial pasta, and. Nobody else could call them Celentani, so they came up with cavatappi or corkscrews. Wow, that's such but, a beautiful story. <laughs> well, and also, I can't I look that. at them anymore without thinking of no. old Adriano singing <laughs> a pop song with his microphone and bouncing on his knees. We're all going to have to go watch it now. Stephen, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. It truly is a real feast for the eyes, and the recipes I'm in delighted. there are so incredibly delicious. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. And same to you, Allison, and uh, please uh, enjoy uh, feasting your eyes and your palate uh, and your mind on the book.